So we've been talking about um, sanctification for a while. Um, and this, this particular discussion with you guys in India is not really as organized as my messages uh, to our church, but nevertheless, um, I think they've been beneficial. Um, the series that I'm, I'm on uh, for our church is um, still ongoing on sanctification. I think this week will be part um, 10, I think, of our series. And so today, uh, I have some, um, some questions, and uh, it's just a, some kind of loose notes here that I can talk about and we can expand on and, of course, um, expand even further with the question and answer session. But um, the last few messages, we've talked about um, sin in the life of the believer. And um, in sanctification, of course, let me review a little bit. We talked about um, sanctification as Trinitarian. It involves the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, the Father set apart his people in love and election in Christ. And then Christ set apart his people by his blood, or in other words, the, the value of the merit of his work his person and work. And then um, in our lifetimes, the Holy Spirit sets us apart. And uh, we use that text in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. And we talked about how that, that um, aspect of sanctification seems to be the most controversial. And then we started talking about some of the lordship salvation views and some of the other legalistic views. And um, this is the area in our life that we um, would be good to know about, especially because of false teaching that has crept in that has affected um, some uh, believers assurance. And so we have to uh, know who these people are that are giving wrong views of sanctification. We have to guard against it. We have to go to the scripture and find out, you know, what the truth is concerning sanctification. And um, we, going back to the idea of the whole Trinity involved in sanctification and the three different aspects. And we could even talk about the fourth aspect concerning the word of God out of John 17, 17, that, that we're sanctified by. Um, maybe we'll do a whole complete message on that part, but let's be reminded that all three aspects of the Trinity in sanctification uh, point to the middle, which is Christ's death, his sanctifying blood, the merit of his righteousness for his people. And that is the, of course, the eternal aspect is going to point toward um, our salvation in Christ, and Christ even has the preeminence there that we are loved in Christ and we are chosen in Christ. And of course, this aspect that we're talking about, sanctification of the Spirit, points back to Christ, and that's our emphasis. And we have to, as we live the Christian life, realize that the Spirit testifies of Christ, and Christ has preeminence there. And this is the gospel platform that we live our Christian life from is a good solid gospel foundation otherwise uh, we would be distracted from uh, these different movements that have error and that would cause us to look within ourselves or look someplace else other than christ and him crucified so again we're talking about sin in the life of the believer and we want to talk a little bit about uh, repentance and just let me just give kind of an introduction on, on repentance. We know that repentance is a change of mind. That's what the word means. And we know that, um, that, that the promise of the new covenant, it's promised that God would give his people, um, would take out the heart of stone and put in a new heart. 
And of course, this is the area of sanctification that we're talking about because we know by nature, man is totally depraved and is spiritually dead and needs a change of heart even before they can even believe. So the basics of sovereign grace and when I mention sovereign grace, I always mention sovereign grace, Calvinist reform theology. And that just kind of covers the broad spectrum of those that would hold to the doctrines of grace. We know that, um, as we said initially, there are so many varieties of um, views on this thing. We have to cut through all the, all the errors and bring it back to what the scripture says. But we know that... Um, the, the basics are that regeneration precedes faith. This is uh, what some people might call, this is Calvinism 101 or Sovereign Grace 101. It's the basic essential teachings of the doctrines of grace because those that are spiritually dead can't do anything. So that should be given life. They have to be given this new heart. In other words, a new mind so that they can believe. We know there are certain texts that say, um, a lot of go-to texts that we go to right away, no man can come unto me unless the Father would sent me draw him. Verses like that, that cut through um, these errors of Arminianism and semi-Pelagianism and so on that would try to say, that we believe in order to be born again, which is, is heresy. So by nature, we know the problem. We know that we have a need of the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, regeneration and conversion. So repentance is part of that work that um, the spirit regenerates, gives faith, and gives repentance. And of course, among legalism and, and lordship and all these wrong views, we see um, sort of sometimes a, a, either a wrong emphasis on repentance, maybe a wrong definition of repentance, maybe not distinctions made concerning initial repentance and, and what it's all about and ongoing repentance. And then, of course, the idea of confession of sin uh, in the life of the believer. We could even talk about the, um, the wrong views of the Armenian easy believism that talks about confession as if it is some form of um, condition that is related to uh, the altar call the invitation system, the sinner's prayer, and all that. So you have, you have um, really two extremes. You have easy believism, which is a false gospel, and then lordship, which is a false gospel. And they're arguing against each other, and neither group are getting to the gospel. And both, both groups pervert the gospel. And we can talk in much detail about how that's done. But initial repentance, uh, we've, we've talked about before, I think that it is repentance from a false gospel. It's a repentance from our self-righteousness. When our eyes are open to uh, our need of a righteousness that we cannot produce, a righteousness that answers the demands of God's law and justice, then we see that this is a righteousness that is outside of ourselves. When before we had the idea of, as it says in Romans 10, one through four there, that we didn't have any knowledge. We were ignorant of the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel, which is spoken of in Romans 1, 16 and 17. That's the power of God and the salvation because in it is revealed the righteousness of God, which is the righteousness that Christ brought in and established for his people to be imputed to them for justification. So in religion, people are ignorant of that gospel. So they are going about, as it says in Romans 10, going about to establish a righteousness of their own and having not submitted to the righteousness of God. 
And then in verse four, it talks about how that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So before that point, um, we have these sinners, unregenerate, unconverted, that are guilty under the law. They are identified in Adam and they have to be rescued from that problem, from that. This is this is salvation in time. So that brings us to back to this issue of repentance. So initially, repentance is God brings us to see our state that we're in and our need of a change of mind. And he works that change of mind in us at conversion. Repentance is not an offer, just like faith is not an offer. Repentance is not a condition, just like faith is not a condition. These are powerful works of the Holy Spirit worked in the elect powerfully. We talked about how faith is worked in the elect. It's a work of God worked in the elect with the same power that it took to raise Christ from the dead. That's in Ephesians chapter one, uh, somewhere around verse uh, 16, I think, somewhere around there. So obviously, when we read verses like that, we can um, see that it is not by the will of man. It's not by free will. And of course, we know that regeneration has to precede that because dead people cannot do things spiritually because spiritual things are spiritually understood. And those that don't have the spirit, they're dead. They can't understand. And then they go about with their natural carnal ways of trying to uh, be accepted by God by what they do, even if it's by what they think they believe with their will. Of course, that's always connected to a false gospel, uh, a false gospel that shows a Christ, small c, that is a false God, small g, that can't get anything done and that failed at the cross. And so they think they have to do things to make up the insufficiency of the cross so that they can make the difference rather than Christ make the difference. So these things are basic, and I hope everyone's on the same page there. So re initial repentance is, is, would be considered evangelical repentance. And when I use that word, I don't want to tie it to false evangelicalism. Ev evangelical just is tied to the idea of the gospel. As opposed to, for example, the Catholic Church believes that salvation is in the church by sacraments or other religions believe that it's something that's not connected to the gospel at all. So you have gospel repent. We can just call it gospel repentance. Uh, God grants that. And so this would be a time in a person's life that there is this line drawn and they would say that this is when I was saved in time. And they would look back before that point and they would say, before that, I've repented of all my other ideas about God, all my false professions and would would see clearly uh, a time when they were um, became believers. Now, uh, this confession of faith, uh, this time period, we're not saying that you have to know the very um, hour that you were converted um, or the day, even the day. But the point is we have to be able to look back at some time and say there was a there was a time where I didn't believe the truth and I did not love the true God of the Bible. I didn't understand the gospel. And so that is the time in everyone's mind now that is that is hearing this message has to kind of figure that out, that time frame. Uh, some people do know that, like, for example, I, uh, I know exactly where I was. I know what time of evening it was. I was driving in my car and it was January um, 5th, 1987. I was actually coming back, driving back home from uh, seminary. 
uh, when I was converted in my car driving. But that's not required of everybody to figure out the precision there of that. It's not that important. But again, the general time frame where you can look back and say, I used to believe the false gospel, kind of know when that was and what I even believed when I believed the false gospel. And then now I believe the true gospel, which features this true Christ that accomplished real salvation for his people effectually. So that's the initial repentance, the initial change of mind. And that's a gift of God by grace. This is salvation by sovereign grace because salvation is of the Lord from start to finish. And then ongoing repentance would be, uh, would look a lot different than pre-conversion false repentance. So we can talk a little bit about how that, how that looks. We know that before we were saved, if we were in false religion, uh, even if it was another religion that is not even Christianity, there is always this idea of, of repentance or meritorious salvation in a, in a wrong way. And sometimes when I talk about it, I just call that uh, legal repentance that's tied to legalism, which involves this idea that sin got me into this problem, so obedience will get me out of it. And then the overall false view that is kind of what a lot of people talk about, that if my good outweighs my bad on judgment, I'm going to be okay. So it becomes this, in false religion, it becomes this false idea of repentance being a condition and also uh, being some type of a, of a, a tally or accounting of how well you repent, how often you repent, and if you've repented of everything, and of course, the emphasis would be on sins of immorality. And most people in false religion, I would say pretty much all, are unfamiliar with self-righteousness when it comes to the gospel, of course, because they don't know the true gospel until God reveals it to them. So this is what we had talked about in uh, some messages past about the conscience, what the conscience does and how that the conscience cannot detect that sin of self-righteousness. So the day a person is converted, God reveals this to them that they have been self-righteous. And that is the thing that had been blocking them and blinding them from the truth. So in the same day of your conversion, God shows and reveals Christ's righteousness, which automatically, two sides of the same coin, faith and repentance, causes the believer to drop his self-righteousness. He was invested in his self-righteousness before. And we see this in Philippians 3 with, the, with Paul talking, and Paul, I believe, is a pattern of repentance. He was invested in his own righteousness. And then he counted that as loss so that he may gain Christ and be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of his own, which is according to the law, but the righteousness that's tied to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the day that God gives faith in Christ that sees this faithful work of Christ for his people, for his sheep, so ongoing repentance looks completely different than false repentance before conversion. Uh, ongoing repentance um, is, a, is a godly sorrow over sin. And um, so let me touch on one thing. So remember in, in false religion, we had talked about the conscience, how that the conscience can detect immorality. We looked at Romans 2 how that the law is written on the heart, which I believe is talking about the conscience that was imparted after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. And this is the, this is the law that we, we have by nature in our minds concerning morality, things that are right, things that are wrong, that is automatically on all natural men's hearts. 
And so this, this repent, this conscience before conversion could detect immorality. So after conversion, we know that the conscience is cleansed, it's purged, and we have a cleansed conscience, and it's associated with the truth of the gospel. And so if or since we had that ability before in our conscience to detect sin, we still have those same ideas in our mind that we can still detect sin even without reading in the scripture because we could detect it before being ignorant of the gospel, even without the Holy Spirit. But now we have a cleansed conscience, we have the Holy Spirit, and we have the means of the word of God, and we can, we are guided by the Spirit to see the depths of sin even further, and how that um, the law is put under a magnifying glass. And we had talked about the, the, the spirit of the law versus the letter, how that the law is amplified in sins of the heart even before they're committed outwardly like adultery looking with lust is the sin of the heart even even if it doesn't take place followed through with the sin of murder is hatred in the heart even if it doesn't react in violence it's in the heart and there are several other things you can give examples of that are in the heart before they act out. Um, so what looks different in the life of the believer when it comes to repentance? And we're gonna talk a little about the connection between confession. I think we did a little bit before, confession and repentance. We know that confession is saying the same word about anything like confessing Christ is saying the same word about Christ that Christ says about himself in the word. Uh, it's, it's put together by two Greek words, homo and logeo. And logeo is tied to the word logo, which means word. So saying the same word about something. So our sins, we, uh, we are agreeing with God in his word, what it says about sins that we commit. So when we commit these things and we confess them to God, we're saying that we committed them. We're not gonna give excuses that we didn't or try to blame it on somebody else like, like Adam did and Eve did in the garden. We're saying that we did it, um, it's wrong. It's not okay. There's no excuse. And, and on and on and on. But part of that confession, which is tied to the initial repentance of a, you know, repentance from a false gospel, makes this repentance after conversion look way different than pre-conversion false repentance. So we when we sin and we repent now, there's some things that are different. And one is we are reminded that there's nothing that we can do to make up for the sin that we committed. And we are drawn to and brought back to the cross to see that's where sins were taken care of was at the cross. There's nothing I cannot do good to make up for my bad for God. Now, in our daily lives, when we uh, maybe uh, have sins that are directed toward people and we want to reconcile with people, of course, uh, what comes from our heart is the sorrow that we've caused in a relationship and we want to um, do good to the people after we have offended them. And um, those that would give excuse or try to downplay, they kind of don't care about the relationship, and uh, which, which means this confession of repentance is, 
it's not really that genuine and it kind of that is brought to light in in relationships with people so you know, for the for the purpose of study we can see there is a difference between confession of sin to god repentance connected to god or the other side connected to people and um, we know that anything directed toward people if it's believers non-believers it doesn't matter um, it's still sin against god so when david sinned in psalm there he he talked about his sin and we know it was toward bathsheba it was toward uh, everybody really connected with him and uh, when he had bathsheba's husband killed it, this was kind of people related but when he when he came to god in his prayer of confession and repentance, he 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 made it Godward, pr primarily Godward. He said, "I sinned against you." And so, there's a lot of things in play here when it comes to this idea of sin in the life of the believer, and then and then the steps that we take after we sin in connection with God and with people. So. Um, the thing that we need to remember is ongoing repentance should not look like previous false repentance before we believe the gospel. No legalism. When you add legalism, and this is the problem, this is why we're talking about sanctification. When you add legalism into your life, if it creeps in, lordship and all these things, it will affect not only your assurance, but it will um, affect this this whole idea of um, the transparency or the sincerity concerning relationships when it comes to sin after we sin. Sometimes those things take a long time to kind of get in our minds and us get solid about them and to let them be condensed down and solidified as we live from day to day in this Christian life and are exercised in the word of God and how to deal with um, God and people on a gospel foundation or platform. So that, that, that's a large discussion of just what we talked about. And it, it's an ongoing dis discussion. So not only is the gospel and, and all the doctrines surrounding the gospel that we see, especially if we're going through the the New Testament letters, normally the very beginning of the New Testament letters are laid out with, with solid doctrine and theological gospel statements. And then usually the second half of all the letters deals with practical application and instruction for living the Christian life. So there is our subject of sanctification in that uh, at least the sanctification of the spirit in that second part of the New Testament letters. So there are instructions there. Those instructions are not to be dismissed or avoided. And there's some in um, maybe some sovereign grace Calvinistic reformed um, groups that don't want to hear too much about that instruction. Or if um, a preacher is to start preaching on them, Maybe they want to kind of dismiss it as maybe leaning toward legalism, which is, of course, not the case because this is God's word. And we know that God's word has to be taught in its context and even be taught the right way because these sovereign grace, Calvinist reform people that are legalists claim to believe the doctrines of grace, claim to believe the gospel. But yet when they talk about the instruction, that's when they start making it conditional and they devalue the cross. So we kind of get a good overview there what's going on. Let me touch one more thing on uh, repentance versus, um, maybe not versus, but repentance in connection with confession of sin. I think uh, when the, after the believers converted, I think the scripture kind of talks more primarily and puts a heavier emphasis on confession there is a connection between the two, but, um, and let me tell you why I say that. Repentance, again, is, is a change of mind. 
Now, we talked about pre-conversion, how that we knew by our conscience, we could detect sins of immorality. So after we're converted, we still can, but now we have the advantage of the spirit, the gospel, and all the instructions in the word of God. And it does look different, different motive, different ground. It's not a condition and so on. So let's say that uh, a believer, um, we could get several different examples if we would just um, look at a few of the commandments. Um, let's say stealing, for example. Um, and a lot of people look at, and we can magnify that, you know, like Christ did, we could spiritualize that. You know, most people think that, okay, stealing is like maybe going to a store and shoplifting, getting a product and put it under your coat and walking out with it without paying. Of course, that's obvious that that's stealing. But, you know, society has a has kind of a problem with looking at, um, quote unquote, big sins versus little sins. Like if uh, you're shopping. You go to a store that you shop a lot in and um, you're going to buy a pound of candy and you scoop it out and put it in a bag. And maybe um, you tried one, you know, and you ate one. I want to see if this candy is worth buying. I mean, really, technically. That is considered stealing. Um, if you um, are weighing some candy, say for I'm sticking, I don't know why I'm talking about candy probably because I'm hungry and I, and I shouldn't be eating candy, but I like candy. <laughs> it's not good for you. But if um, you scoop a little extra in there after you've weighed it, of course, that's stealing. And so people view things like, OK, I go rob a bank. That's stealing. What about further when you um, are working for somebody and um, you maybe you don't have to clock in, you know, you don't have to punch in, you register your time and you show up late, but you count it as your time there. And then, of course, you get used to that and you show up a little bit later. Or when you're there, you're supposed to be doing a certain thing. But if you're over like talking to people and not working, you're not only you're not only you yourself not working, but you're causing other people not to work. And so it is taking uh, the value of work from the company. And some people might think, well, who cares? Well, uh, first of all, this is why I brought up, it's considered stealing. But what if you were the owner of the company? You would care. And this brings us back to that general idea, do unto others as you would have others do unto yourself. So you start to see the, as you put sins, which are transgressions of the law under a microscope and you start to magnify it, you start to see that <laughs> there's not much that we're involved with, that we're not cheating somewhere here and there when it comes to the law and breaking of the law. And so when we talk about like lordship and legalism, we have to be brought back to the gospel that God requires absolute perfect obedience. Of course, we know that that can only be in Christ. Perfection is in Christ. Christ never sinned ever. And here we come along and um, we realized pre-conversion, our conscience detected all these sins and it, and it stirred us up to try to do something to make up for it. And then we're given the gospel and now we're believers and we're under grace and not under law. As we go about in our daily lives, um, and for example, me, I don't primarily think about these things that I've been talking about concerning the, the minute and the, and the magnified things of the law. I've thought about them several different times throughout my life, but that is not my and I don't think it should be my priority of focus. My priority of focus is Christ and him crucified. And if I'm going to think about these um, 
distinct things about transgressions and all that, I have to think about it in connection with Christ and him crucified. Otherwise, I'm going to be miserable and I won't be able to live my life and I'll be walking on eggshells with anxiety and stress. So again, the scripture is already balanced. We have to balance our mind and how we deal with all these things. So there's a lot to talk about there. And as you, as you live your life, I mean, we can't run around and not be able to function because we're so, uh, we don't want to be brought back under the law and feel guilty all the time. When it comes to transgressions, we know that Christ paid for them. They're not imputed to us. We are not legally guilty. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. But we know in reality, we transgress. First John, I think it's um, seven, eight, and nine, or eight, nine, and 10, somewhere around there. It talks about that if we say we have no sin, and then it says if we have not sinned, and so on, then we make him a liar, and the truth is not in us. So we continue to transgress every day. And we looked at Romans 7, how that Paul said, um, when he would do good, evil was present with me. He talked about carrying around this body of death. And then we realized that when we see that, it, to be able to function in a Christian life, we have to understand that we're not identified anymore legally as a sinner. We're not in Adam anymore. And he said, you know, this the sin that I do, he, he says pretty much, that's not me. And so the me he's talking about there is the new creation in Christ. I'm accepted. I'm not in the eyes of God. I'm not considered anymore a sinner when it comes to the legal aspect of it. And so some people uh, would accuse us of saying, well, now you can just go out and do whatever you want. You have a license to sin. And some people that dabble in religion and even dabbled in sovereign grace would see that and take advantage of that. So, you know, I don't, I don't have to worry about anything. I can just do whatever I want. And then they flagrantly um, do act upon this license of sin. And then, of course, when that happens, that makes us trying to preach the truth uh, have to deal with those people and the other people. It's a big mess in religion. So ongoing repentance, since we already know, again, pre-conversion, we already know that certain things of immorality are wrong. So after salvation, I think that maybe a, if a person gets um, lackadaisical, gets lazy, um, doesn't seem to care, and this may be a slow process where a, a certain thing might take place, and then they are convinced by the spirit. They're convicted by the spirit. They see in the scripture, they're reminded, hey, I see this. I shouldn't be doing that. And then they're reminded. And then they agree to it in the scripture. They see it. They understand it. They believe it. They agree to it. Then I think that is the emphasis on, you know what? I'm changing, God's given me a change of mind about this. And so it's a reminder of um, the need of the change of mind and, and that's repentance. But I think for the most part, we do know, we do continue to know, and we don't need really that many reminders. We have enough reminders already automatically because of what we know now, what we've been uh, given knowledge of what's been revealed to us of what sin is. And it, and it seems like the Christian life is more concerned with confession of sin and not that much connected to repentance, even though repentance is there and it, and it should be uh, utilized in the life of the believer. And God makes sure that happens. And he's the one that providentially sets up our whole lives and has decreed everything, even, even sin. Uh, so I hope that part was not confusing, but I, I, I think 
again, the Christian life is more, the emphasis is confession with sin. So back to repentance, there's a few questions I had written down here in some of these notes that I was going to use in, in the series when it comes to uh, repentance. And some of these questions, um, I think, have to be asked, and I think they're asked in a certain way that um, are um, kind of silly, and I did that on purpose. Um, so here's a question. Did Christ only die for the sins that the elect have stopped? So let's say um, somebody does um, drugs. Let's say somebody uh, uses heroin. So God saves a person. They see that... Uh, they have this heroin problem, and then they stop heroin. Has God forgive them of that sin because they repented of that sin and they stopped heroin? Well, first of all, there are people that are not even believers. I know some that are not even believers that have stopped heroin. Uh, you can tame a snake. Uh, you've seen... Uh, I guess over uh, somewhere over maybe in your country, there's cobras. I know there's some cobras, different places and people tame them. They can do certain things to put them in a basket and, you know, whatever. That's that idea, you know, like people uh, by nature are snakes and people can be tamed and be caused to change by behavioral modification. Uh, murderers can stop murdering. As far as physically, um, stealers can stop stealing. And sometimes the prison system or the jail system are reformed. You know, there's processes that that help that change or just their conscience. They say, you know, I really screwed up and I offended these people and I love these people. So I'm going to stop doing this. And they stop. It doesn't mean their sins are forgiven. Right. So. The conditional thing, why bring the conditional thing of a false gospel into the true gospel and say, Christ only died for the sins that you repent of? And that's a, that's a ridiculous notion. That's why I brought it up so we can think through this thing. Um, so if that's what a person thinks, here's the question. Have you stopped sinning all the sins that you commit? Because there's sins that are brought to your mind that you repent of. But if we still sin every day, have you stopped? If God only forgives sins that you stopped, have you stopped sinning all the sins that you continue to commit? Well, of course not. It's obvious. Um, so I just wanted to bring on its face this ridiculous idea that salvation is maintained by the frequency of, of, of having less frequent sins, because that's sort of the false idea of, of some that believe progressive sanctification, that you sin less and less and less. Well, you would think if you would live long enough, you're going to completely stop sinning. Um, we know John Wesley um, promoted this idea of, of perfectionism, where he taught that a believer could get to a point where they do stop sinning. And believe it or not, I heard a uh, Lordship guy not too long ago um, talking about this on video. He claims to be sovereign grace. Uh, Tim Conway in a video he, he runs the organization called I'll Be Honest. They have a YouTube channel. And um, there's a video. I'd have to search it out again. But he's talking in a, in a, in a service there, kind of informal with his congregation. And he brings this up. He says, you know, Wesley had this, this, this idea that a person could actually, you know, get to the point where they stop sinning. And, um, 
you know, I, I think you could hear some people laugh in the congregation. And he said, no, 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 I'm serious. We need to consider this. And you could tell it seemingly to me, you could tell by the way he was talking that he thought this was a good idea and that they needed to talk about it and maybe work to that end. Now, of course, we're to avoid sin, no doubt about it. We're to we're, we're told we're commanded to not sin. There was a person in his congregation that you could hear it. You could hear the question and he raised his hand. And he was asking about, yeah, but what about, what about the gospel? <laughs> what about the fact that our sins were taken care of, you know, justification. And he said, yeah, I know about that, but that's not what we're talking about today. And he wanted to talk about this perfectionist idea. So you see how that, um, this 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 guy was insane sort of really talking about this he was so caught up in this this legalistic idea about pressing this idea and some of his own people in the congregation wanted to hear the gospel instead of this false idea of john wesley and his of course we know wesley what a heretic he was armenian now it says in um Getting back to some of these questions, it says in uh, James, of course, uh, 2.10, that whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. In other words, the whole law as a unit. So, so since we know that um, and would hope that everyone would admit that a person would, would readily admit that he at least sins once a day. That means you're breaking the whole law. According to James 2.10, you're breaking the whole law every day. We really know that we sin multiple times a day. Uh, I would hope that even the Lordship people would admit that they sin multiple times a day. And so the way they talk about repentance and Lordship salvation seemingly make it conditional here i think is the inconsistency that that should be seen really quickly that if they continue to sin and and i know that they have big sins and little sins uh, they would say homosexuality adultery murder and abortion things like that are the big ones right um, and then the other ones that people maybe don't see, you, know, you don't, you wouldn't read about in the news would be the little sins. And this is a lot of, a lot of people have this in their mind. Of course, it's a, it's a bad idea, but if they are sinning multiple times a day, breaking the whole law multiple times a day, that doesn't line up or match with their accusation against not only easy believism, but also us that teach the gospel. They would accuse us of being antinomian because we don't teach like they do and press these things, which I'm bringing up an inconsistency here. The point is, if the idea of progressive sanctification is sinning less and less and less, and tied to sinning less is repentance, at some point, we have to stop and say, hey, Mr. Legalist, what's wrong with your repentance? How come your repentance is not working? And so since they don't see the idea, the truth in scripture that God demands absolute perfection, a lot of false religion just continues to lower the standard. And then you talk about maybe the next level and you show their inconsistency, they'll lower it down again. So they'll say, yeah, I, I, I have problem doing a certain thing, but, but I repent of it. As soon as I do it, I repent of it. Almost implying that repentance is a condition for forgiveness. And we know that it's not. And then if they continue to do it, it's like, I understand it's a problem and I've asked people to pray for me and I'm trying, 
God knows my heart. My, I have, I have, I'm sincere. So that's another level sincerity or desires like John MacArthur talks about when it comes to assurance, it's not about the cross. It's about your desires, which is a distracting lie. So the standard continues to be lower. So think of the scenario of the, uh, uh, Matthew 7, in that day, many will say unto me, but Lord, Lord, didn't I do these things? And so lower the standard, Lord, Lord, but I did the best I could. I was sincere and I had the right desires. That's not going to fly. That's not going to fly. So our plea in that day of judgment needs to be what our plea is now, which is, should be, according to the gospel, Christ alone, right? It's not I, 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 it's him, Christ and him crucified. So the continual sin in the life of the believer pre does present a problem. It doesn't for us in our minds, if we're accustomed to what the gospel is and all the implications and particulars of the gospel living this Christian life if we've been given God-given faith. It's not that big of a problem as it is for these people that we're looking into that are inconsistent and really show that their, their gospel is not sufficient and that they're trying to make up the difference in their own life, which we know that's an impossibility. They're trying to take care of the sin problem by self, And we start out the journey realizing the sin problem has been already taken care of. Christ won the victory. Now, this other war is in our minds, and it's as we live by faith and walk in the spirit. So we see a difference. It's like night and day difference in the different um, mindset that we are to have. So we know sins are forgiven. Even when we um, confess our sins, it's not conditional. We know that our sins have been forgiven by the merit of Christ's blood on our account, that work that he did to take sin away. So by faith, believers when it comes to confessing or repenting, it's to be done by faith. Faith sees that what we're doing in confession or repentance is not some form of a righteousness, but faith sees we are already forgiven. We're already accepted in Christ, even before we take the step to confess or believe. So that's the difference. And again, so we've talked about in other messages how that our uh, our motive or our, our incentive for obeying God is uh, love and gratitude. We're thankful for what he did for us. Therefore we have a we have a, a, a new kind of fear, not a dread like we did before, but a, a fear that that is referring to, uh, respect and honor uh, and, and awe, A-W-E, for his character. We have a reverence for, for not only him, now a proper reverence for the law. And we see that Christ had to do something with the law. We can't do anything with it, but transgress it. So, there are some ideas there that, um, let me see what else I have here in uh, some of these notes if it's worth, if it's worth saying, or we should maybe open up for questions. Give me one second here. So really, whenever we talk about this, the questions that I posed about repentance, you could also exchange the word confess, confession of sins, either confession or repentance, the same questions would apply here. Here's something else too. And we we've talked a little bit about this and it's kind of mixed among 
some lordship or legalists about this idea. Um, some might go further and say, we are not forgiven of the sins that we sin willfully. So, of course, it you know comes up about this misinterpretation of Hebrews chapter 10. And verse 26, if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there therefore remains no more sacrifice for sins. So there's the misinterpretation of that. People thinking that that just means sin in general of immorality. But in the context, we know that that's talking about a specific sin of unbelief or apostasy or going back to an inferior system of the old covenant that has to do with law. In other words, rejecting the gospel and going back into a false gospel. Even if it's, even if we could even call, you know, old covenant Judaism, like the Pharisees, we call that a false gospel, even though it's not like things that we might be involved with in times past when it comes to evangelical Christianity, false gospel. So uh, the sins that we commit after we are converted are not accidental. I mean, we're in there, we're doing it. We have thoughts. We follow through our thoughts with actual following through with sins. And for someone to say that these are not willful, um, they're not being honest. Also, you know, they might say um, that, well, God doesn't forgive sins that are habitual, that, are, that we have a habit of committing. And we can, I can come back and say, well, hold on a minute. You've told me that you sin at least once a day. And you went further and you admitted that you sin multiple times a day. So then you're acting like they're not willful, but we know that they are habitual. You have a habit of, because again, you might talk about you're sincere. You have a desire to stop sinning, but that, that desire to stop sinning is not your propitiation. <laughs> That's not your justification. That doesn't bring forgiveness because you're trying to stop something or you're trying to make it less. That, that, that math does not work out, especially with a God that demands absolute perfection. The remedy must be found outside of yourself with a righteousness imputed to your account in a legal forensic way. And sanctification of the spirit brings your mind to that truth. And that's the way you live your life, that it, that is taken care of. And then the motive and the incentive comes out of gratitude and love. And that's the way you live the Christian life. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. But these people, when it comes to immorality, they will not admit that they do things willfully, that they habitually do them, which means they practice them. So you look at 1 John 3, and it talks about practicing sin. Some of the more modern versions use that phrase, practicing sin, and they look at it just like they misinterpret Hebrews 10, 26, and they'll say it's all sin. And this really muddies, it muddies the waters, it confuses people. And this is how the Lordship doctrine thrives, because people are confused because of the lack of knowledge of, of the true gospel. So it's a mess. Uh, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to start teaching on First um, John pretty soon, that that's a book that a lot of Lordship people try to capitalize on and try to abuse people with. Um, Steve Lawson is real bad for that. So they'd say we're not forgiven for sins that we willfully commit. We're not forgiven of sins that we habitually commit. We're not forgiven of sins that we practice. 
And so they would just say, if you practice those things and habitually do those things, then you might as well give up because it's evidence that you're not even a believer. So that's kind of the idea of lordship, right? Um, they act like they don't make it a condition up front, but on the back end, they'll say, you know, if you're not progressing, getting holier and sinning less, then without holiness, you shall not see the Lord. And your obedience, they say, is MacArthur says your validation that you're saved in the first place under the Lordship of Christ. So in that system, people have fear, guilt, anxiety, and they have to keep up. They have to get on that treadmill of self-righteousness to do better, do better, do better to make up for what they've done wrong. And this is a religious trap. And in, it's just basic self-righteousness with the non-submission to the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel. They call us and they accuse us of having cheap, uh, cheap grace. They say we abuse grace. They call us antinomians, which is, is a wrong, you know, it, it's unwarranted. There's no right for them to say that. They don't even understand the gospel, but we can turn around and say, no, you believe in cheap law. You believe in cheap grace too, but you believe in cheap law. So we understand the law, how it works, how that it, Christ, the only one that could do something with the law, how he came, he was born of a virgin, born of a woman under the law to keep it, to honor it, to magnify it, and to satisfy it. That's why Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, Romans 10, 4. All right, I'll stop there, um, open it up to questions. Any questions yet? What's that? I'm just asking if there are no questions for those who are offline. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm asking other any questions who are online. Uh, 1 John 1 9, where it says, if we confess our sins, that is, if I can paraphrase it in this manner, if we confess our known sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, even those that we try to balance it by doing good. Can I? Yeah, so uh, a lot of people think that, um, okay, so let's go to the extreme. You know, there are some denominations out there that teach that you can lose your salvation. So they would say that once a person is saved, they have to maintain their salvation by obedience. Now, we know that it's very clear, and we brought up some of these things in this message even today, that God demands absolute perfection and that no man, it's clear, no man can keep the law. The, law, the purpose of the law was to show sin. It was to magnify sin, amplify sin. So if a person is committing multiple sins a day, even if they're considered little sins in the minds of some people, then we know that even if a person is thinking, okay, I'm tracking all my sins, I'm charting them up. And as soon as I commit them, I'm re confessing and repenting. Now I'm waiting for the next sin. Okay. And so maybe through some form of practice, and maybe this is what Wesley did, and maybe Tim Conway was trying to get people to do this, is like keep a journal and let's like 
let's like get on top of this and let's figure this out and let's 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 train ourselves to after we just keep doing this we'll get after a while wouldn't you think you get tired of writing stuff down and then you just well if i just stop sending i don't have to write this down and they get better at it every day they think they're polishing it <laughs> and improving um these these ideas when we look at what sin truly is we have to we have to just come to the point come back to the gospel and say God absolute demands absolute perfection. That's only found in Christ. It's an impossibility for a man to keep the law in it. And we see how that it's proved out every day in our own experience, not only by what the scripture says, but even by our own experience on top of it. And Paul's testimony in Romans 7 and many other places where we, we still have remaining sin. And we can't, we can't run this race by competing against our own sin and conditionally repenting ourselves to heaven or confessing ourselves to heaven or making, um, try to balance out this thing by trying to barter with God or try to pay God. This is, this is totally against grace to try to pay God in connection with the wages of sin. I mean, these are, these are basic ideas like in Romans 4, where it talks about what, what has Abraham um, found according to the flesh when it comes to this thing of, of, of grace versus works. And so faith is in place in connection with the gospel to say that God justifies the ungodly. And so this is taken care of at justification. And then in sanctification, really the spirit is reminding us that we have not taken over the responsibility of maintaining our salvation because we can't maintain our salvation because salvation is of the Lord, even in sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. So this ongoing Christian life is not conditioned on whether we um, stop sinning because it's clear that we will always sin every day for the rest of our lives. So we, we see not only just by the pure gospel itself that talks about how that sin was taken care of at the cross, not only that, but all the other doctrine that's in the scripture that proves out that there is no part of salvation that is conditioned on you. And so the, the legalists and the Lordship people would, would emphasize this idea of synergistic sanctification. So monergistic, they would even hold to initial monergistic. They would say, okay, regeneration happens to a person and that person is passive that's monergistic. But then they would say, well, after that, the rest of sanctification that's progressive is synergistic, which, which means and requires of you that you cooperate with the spirit so that you can be made more holy and sin less. That's a wrong idea because we know that salvation is all of grace. Sanctification is by God's free and sovereign grace. It even says it's through faith, Acts 26. And we know that in Philip talks about he that began a good work in you is going to finish it. He's the one doing the work. We know in uh, Hebrews, it says that, that Christ is the author and finish of your faith. We live by faith. We know that in um, Philippians 2, it talks about it is God who works in you, not just to do but both to will and to do. Even the will that comes into your mind to do something, God does the will part and the doing part. He's, <laughs> he's doing it in you. It, this is a work of God. Faith is a work of God. Repentance is a work of God. Good works were foreordained, Ephesians 2.10. We're saved by grace through faith, 
not of works, not of yourself. It's a gift of God. And then it talks about we're his creation in Christ Jesus unto good works, created unto good works that God has before ordained. This is full on absolute sovereignty determinism by God. God is doing this in his people. And at the same time, we know God has decreed all things for his purpose, even sin. So he, he is, we're his creation. He's decreed both good works and sin. And here we are with good works and sin in the life that we live, the Christian life. So off of this gospel platform, we look and we see we're already always and only, now that we've been believers, always and only accepted in Christ. As we step forward by faith, we're to do a work, not to get more righteous or get more holy or to stop sinning, not to stay out of hell. That's already taken care of. So those false motives and those incentives are already brought off the table. Now we're saved by grace. That causes thankfulness. That causes love. And that's the, that's the pure motive of, of, uh, and driving force of serving God and serving others is out of love. So when it comes to texts like this, um, we know other texts that would counter it and say, you know, our confession is not a condition or our repentance is not a condition. So we read these texts that, that maybe if we don't see them in their context, um, some people would say, well, this is a paradox or this is a mystery. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. Salvation is unconditional. This is, this is just saying, this is what believers do. This is what God works in believers to do. Believers that are already forgiven do these things. And they don't do them to merit the forgiveness. God's not going to withhold forgiveness. Christ took care of putting away sin. Um, now, when I get into 1 John, I'll give way more detail about those verses, and it deserves a lot of time, probably a whole message on that verse it deserves, so that people will know. We need to get other texts, of course, uh, compare scripture with scripture, spiritual with spiritual, and really show these things in way more depth. But if a person thinks that that verse is conditional, They've got a lot of problems with the gospel itself. And I don't say that to stop short on not going further on answering that question. I mean, I think I've talked about a lot of things that surround the whole subject that would aid to understanding that, look, this is not conditional. And again, in, in legalism and lordship, there's so many different levels. Uh, I would think that even... Somebody like uh, maybe John MacArthur might even look at that verse and say it's not conditional. I would hope, but that doesn't even matter. That doesn't make me like him anymore. First of all, I don't even know what he would say about it. But um, he puts conditions somewhere, many different places. Uh, is there any more particulars about that particular question about that verse that I could expand on? Or are you willing to maybe wait? for another time where we can just concentrate on that verse. We wait for another time. For a yeah. I don't want to preach uh, the first John series before I even start it. <laughs> but, yeah, so there'll be a lot more things coming out of that series because that is a very popular section of scripture that the Lordship people use to validate salvation in connection with obedience is first John, which, which has caused so many people to even be afraid to read it. And, and same with the book of James and other, other things like that. 